Hi everyone, I'm Francesca Bessi with the Idaho STEM Action Center. In this video, I'll be showing you a simple framework for integrating creative, hands-on projects into your classroom or learning space. This is the first video in our series on student-centered learning design. Part 1. Learn. Educators today, both in and out of school, are under a lot of pressure to provide hands-on learning experiences mm. in order to help their students gain proficiency in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to develop 21st century skills. But many wonder how they're supposed to add hands-on STEM on top of an already very full plate. The key is to treat these projects not as something extra, but as a modified approach to what you already do as an educator. The approach I'm going to share with you today borrows from the field of design thinking, a process which attempts to quantify how designers and engineers solve problems and generate new ideas. Proponents of design thinking are searching for the innovation sweet spot, which lives at the intersection of three criteria, desirability, feasibility, and viability. A good design, whether for a new piece of technology, a lesson plan, or a coffee maker, relies equally on these three elements, which you can think of like a three-legged stool. Let's break each of these concepts down and consider their implications for learning design. Desirability describes the extent to which a design meets a user's specific needs. In learning design, this means identifying the learners you're working with and what they need in order to learn successfully. For example, when designing a science activity for preschoolers, I might consider their need for sensory stimulation, as well as their limited fine motor skills, leading me to pass over the traditional pipette for a more taught-friendly option. Feasibility refers to the capacity to implement a given project in terms of time, money, materials, and technical expertise. This is where we come up against constraints like budget and time in the curriculum, but it is also an opportunity to think creatively about the resources you do have. For example, if you're like a lot of small communities in Idaho, you might not have a public recycling program, which means people probably have a lot of materials like cardboard, tin cans, and plastic bottles lying around. Sometimes, it can be helpful to use what you have a lot of as a starting point for brainstorming an activity about a specific topic. Which brings us to viability. Viability reminds us to think about why we're doing something in the first place. In other words, our goals. From a business perspective, this usually refers to how profitable an idea can be. But in an education context, you can think of an activity's viability as how well it aligns with your curriculum or your organization's mission. Ah. This leg of the stool is the most important to keep in mind if you want to shift from thinking of hands-on as something extra <sighs> to something you can integrate into your existing lessons or programs. Rather than searching for something hands-on to do, Start with something you want or need to teach and ask yourself how you can build hands-on inquiry-based learning into that experience. We'll be delving deeper into each leg of our stool in our upcoming videos in our learning design series. For now, let's head over to the planning studio to see how we might create a learning activity based on these principles. Part two, plan. Recently, when leaving programs at my library, I've noticed a lot of the youth I work with have trouble using rulers, and this gets in the way of their ability to complete activities independently. So, I thought I'd create an activity to help them practice. You can follow along with my planning process, and then try it out for yourself using the companion material included with this video, which you'll find in the description. Let's take a closer look. Applying the first leg of our stool, I need to start out by identifying my learners and their needs. My group of learners consists of children aged 6 to 12, some of whom have sensory or behavioral challenges. Some needs I've identified for this group include freedom to move around while they work, a basic structure to keep them on task, limiting the amount of information given at one time, validation from trusted adults, and an adaptable level of difficulty to accommodate my wide range of ages and abilities. The next leg of our stool is our resources and constraints. 
In my case, I have to keep my activity to an hour, including time for cleanup. I can't count on having another staff member to help me. And I don't have any money to spend on new materials. What I do have is access to all of the library's existing supplies, including scissors, tape, a variety of craft supplies, and lots of recycled materials such as cardboard and toilet paper tubes. In particular, we have a lot of yarn right now, and I'm wondering if I might find a way to use that as a measurement tool. Finally, we come to learning objectives. I already had a general idea in mind, but now I'm going to focus on the specific outcomes or results I want to see. So here's what I came up with. I want the youth participating in this activity to gain practical experience using measurement tools, appreciate the meaning and value of measurement, recognize inches and centimeters as distinct units of measurement, and know how to read a ruler in inches or centimeters. Now it's up to me to come up with a hands-on activity that accomplishes these objectives, is within my capacity, and meets my learners' unique needs. With this knowledge, I'm ready to start brainstorming and put my idea into action. Part three, apply. My idea is to have kids build a simple cotton ball launcher using toilet paper tubes and some rubber bands. I'll provide each child several different sizes of rubber bands and challenge them to figure out the best rubber band for the job by measuring how far the cotton ball launches with each type. Giving them this goal to focus on will provide the structure they need to stay on task during the program. Rather than using rulers, which won't be long enough, the kids will work in pairs and cut pieces of yarn that are the same length as the distance traveled. They will then measure these pieces of yarn against a line I'll mark out on the ground. This will help keep them moving and engaged. I'll introduce the kids to the measuring line at the beginning of the program. Based on what I know about this group's needs, I expect them to respond better to an activity that allows them to discover and share meaningful information about themselves. So, I plan to cut a piece of yarn for each child that is as long as they are tall and let that be the first thing that they measure. We'll record their height in both inches and centimeters, so they can see the difference between the two. I still need to work out some of the details, but I feel confident that I've created an achievable program idea that meets both my objectives and my learners' needs. If you're interested in applying this process for yourself, take a look at the companion PDF for this video, where you'll find prompts to guide you in creating a hands-on activity that meets your needs. If you'd like to dive deeper into any of the topics we explored today, check out the other videos in our learning design series, which are linked in the description below. For even more videos or other great STEM content, hit the button to subscribe or visit resources.stem.idaho.gov. This video was brought to you by the Idaho STEM Action Center. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.